Hey, Corey, how are you doing? Well, that was uh, awkward. I like to be in these awkward. <laughs> the topic we're talking about today mm. is new teams. Either you're new to the team, or the team is new to you, or the team is new, or th <laughs> new things are new. <laughs> I'm so confused. I think you nailed it right there. You yeah. got it. Which one of these do you want to handle first? You want to handle uh, a, a team that's new or a team that's new to you? Let's do the the new team. A team that's new. Yeah, a team that's new. Oh, okay. Not new to me. All right. A team that's new that is being formed. All right. So if the team is new and I am being added to the team as well, my question would be, how much, if any, Agile have they been doing? Because uh, that uh -oh. is going to determine a lot of things of what you would do with a, a new team. If a team has no Agile experience, that means my purpose is really to train them and guide them and go through all the change management and, and like do the analysis of what, if any, process that they currently have going aligns with Agile to really understand the scope of the change management that you'll have to undertake to get them to even partially Agile, regardless of whatever framework you're going to use. I feel it's too early to start altering our agenda radically, <laughs> but I also feel... But I also feel like I need to right now, and I'm just going to go... <laughs> I, I also feel that this is my role on the podcast. Ohm's role is to enlighten us and give us wisdom. And my role... And translate is, all of Brian's and rambling on. My role is yeah. to sprinkle chaos. <laughs> sprinkle uh, chaos. As, as Ohm goes, mm, yeah, well, let me really yeah. in. There's two uh, lanes that are happening. Technical agility or businesses a team can already be doing good technical agility mm -hmm. and have like a, let's let's say a team is formed for the first time they come to an organization like i need to divide this between like an organization that has one team like a single mm -hmm. team i don't know a startup or something <clears throat> like that it just has one development team versus a program that's expanding and maybe they started with one team now they need to add two three teams whatever mm -hmm. right um the first team that is part of the program, assuming you're working out of one backlog, there should be some sort of technical agility is already in place, I would hope. You would hope, I, I, but that's also part of the analysis that you have to do is like, what is the level of agile maturity for the organization as well? Because if the leadership and the org have not been doing it and they're like, hey, we're just starting out with this thing and they're bringing you in, that's all of the aspects you have to tackle. So I've been in teams where there was a new team, they've never been doing this before, and having to deal with the team forming, deal with the business agility, and help the product owner and the team understand how to even build the backlog. Because it was a, hey, this is my job, here's the world I live in, and I track my own work and just do whatever I want, how I want and having to guide them through that whole process. So there's multiple lanes that you'd have to deal with when it's a new team with no Agile. I would expect one of the first things you're gonna run into is gonna be having a backlog at all. Like, uh, I would expect one of the first things you run into is the team would run out their entire backlog, pull it into the sprint, and you'd basically have no backlog. You could, I mean, it depends if it's a new product and then they, they really just don't and it's, we have no idea what to do or you're picking up an existing product, whatever they had, and they're having to reframe it into a product backlog, which I feel like is, is much harder to teach them how to reframe the work because yeah. they're so used to working in projects and well, how would I know what I can do in this time frame? Because yeah. it all depends on blah, 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 all the stuff that comes yeah, with yeah. that. Where if it's a new product, it's like, hey, you got a new request, all right, put it in the backlog, sounds great. Uh, and yeah. done. <laughs> Let, let's 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 pick a lane. And, All right, uh, which explore, lane would you explore like? Explore where it goes. Let's, which let's, lane? Let's pick the harder like? of the two. I think the harder lane is you're transforming someone who's been not working in agile. I didn't want to say waterfall. Who's not been working in agile? Correct. And they're like, wow, like the, the, the way we have to do is we got to do all the requirements up front, and then we got to do all the whatever. We got to do all the like you got to tell me everything I got to develop, so that I don't get caught. With any without anything that was in the requirements, and you can't move the goalposts on me and whatever you know, like some kind of developer like forcing a stability mm -hmm. on 
the I guess product. Well, yeah, and that's, typically that's the culture that they've lived in and yeah. worked in is that they were reprimanded for not getting the right requirement. It was their fault afterwards. So now that's a learned behavior that I, I don't fault them for it. There's another situation where they actually were responsible for the requirements gathering from everything from working with the business to releasing, they had that role. And now you're asking them, you're only gonna do this other part over here, but this other person's responsible for getting the requirements, creating the backlog, getting all the information you need. So that's a bit of, you know, who moved my cheese control problem that you have to deal with too, because if they don't have trust in that person to do that, or that person doesn't know what they're doing yet, now you have even more issues, not even aligned with like the team working together. It's just getting the team to understand your job has changed and now they're very fearful of their performance because performance previously was, all right, I get this thing, I do my stuff, and it all shines on me. Right. Now, you're saying somebody else does this thing, they do it wrong, but then it comes to me, and now everything that gets missed going down to completion mm -hmm. has continuous levels of possible failure that they feel is gonna fall back on them. Yeah. So there's, there's a whole nuance to where they've been the the sole person dealing with something before yeah and having to change yeah so management level would you try to head that off to say you can't transform your teams to work in this different way and still use the same bonus structure goals, evaluation uh, yes. metrics you know go correct uh, we still have individual goals but we, uh, we call them okrs now because uh that's what's popular in the industry mm -hmm. yeah because if you don't have a way to say, I did X and I was responsible for it, now it's a shared responsibility, which is the intent of having the team so that you can benefit from all those things. If the compensation and or performance structure does not adjust to match that, you're not going to get their ability to even change because they're going to still, even they might say, okay, yeah, I got it in the backlog. What you're gonna have happen is, that's my PBI. I'm the only person that works on that PBI story, whatever you want right. to call it. Yeah. You're going to have the same thing just under the name of Agile, but really under the hood, it's the same stuff they've been doing for years, which we've seen time and time again. All right, f uh, fix it for me. Like, how fix we, it. How oh, sounds it? great. How okay. You, you, are, <laughs> you are now in charge. Like, I am the CEO. I want this fixed. You tell me what to do. Well, we need to reframe the structure for goals, their reviews, et cetera. You have to deal with all the HR comp competencies uh -oh. and do that reformation, which is can take a very long time. It might be to the point of, we are not doing the same performance goals that you used to do, and it is now on a shared performance, mm -hmm. which is terrifying for a lot of people, because if they have team members that they feel are not up to par, how am I going to get what I'm worth? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to build that trust in the team that everyone's work is going to be recognized and that's where the scrum master and the product owner have to build that safety for them to say, it is okay for you to fail. It is a shared responsibility with everyone. If the team fails, we all fail. That encourages them to, okay, if we have somebody that's not performing, how do we get them trained? How do we adjust that behavior to ensure that we're not being held behind from those people? This is, a, this is the hardest part because you will have, unfortunately, people that the team doesn't trust or feel are up to par, always. Yeah. 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 So like, how, how do I deal with that? 
how do you do it? Yeah, like I, if, so. If I'm if I'm just like we don't normally go down the role of transforming HR into podcasts mm-hmm. in the first ten minutes of the podcast. So oh, okay. Sorry. Thank, well, thank, apologies thank you, thank for you. open up that can of worms. We, we save that until uh, like forty five minutes in when we've all had a couple of drinks. <laughs> just call HR. Tell them to fix it. Because because the, the HR is not like they're not gonna. They're, no, like, they, no. There, there are no like H, uh, finance. I think the same thing about finance. Correct. Because like you got one or two finance guys and they deal with internal payroll and they pay everyone and that's like that you know they cash out at the end of the day their numbers are not tied to teams that they support same thing with hr it's not like you have one hr person who i well most companies that Mm -hmm. i work with that's why i I, let me frame this for a second Mm -hmm. because there are companies out there that i know that work in this way mainly what ones i was talking about before they have hiring managers across groups Mm -hmm. they work with and they only work with a certain uh, few uh, i say groups but I really mean teams. Yeah. So they work with like, I don't know, half a dozen teams or maybe more than that. I don't mm-hmm. really know what the number is, but they work with a few teams and that recruiter works with those teams mm-hmm. to deal with, they're involved with all aspects of hiring to make sure that everyone who's, who's involved in doing interviews has like basic interview skills. They make sure what questions they're going to mm-hmm. ask, go back to some kind of common set of, this is what our company values, this is what teams value. And they're Which responsible for cool. everyone that's on the team skills yes they're they're responsible for all the things that are yeah. hr generalist yes. or hr resource yeah. manager related to to that related that's to, a to the skill whole yes other area but, but just like bringing a dba onto your team mm-hmm. for four sprints mm-hmm. because you've got these database issues that just plague you that you need to get over and then they're going to get on come onto your team they're going to maybe they'll do a lot of the heavy heavy tasks mm-hmm. but they will try to pass their knowledge along the whole time they're working with your team. Mm-hmm. They'll try to peer as much as possible, mob as, as much as possible, mm-hmm. so that when they leave, your team is stronger dealing with any database-related issues right. uh, when they leave. An HR person living, they, they're not working with your team day to day, but mm-hmm. the different people who are with your team that are involved in doing interviews and trying to bring people in and stuff like that, they're helping and coaching those people, and that's their role with those people. Okay, great, awesome. Most companies, however, the finance person and the HR person, they don't sit with those teams. They sit with the C-suite team, mm-hmm. and they only work for that one team, and they protect and mm-hmm. you know uh, do that team's bidding, basically. And, and even still, most organizations, even if they do have like an HR business partner or their dedicated person, they're still not in, involved close enough with the teams to see and understand and, and typically you wouldn't even go to HR unless it's like something that needs to be escalated. So this is the yeah. role of the team members, scrum master and or managers for the various people to have the coaching sessions. Mm-hmm. So I've had to actually have weekly sessions with the team members in the beginning to say, okay, what are our problems? Like yeah. straight out are there issues with the team? Is there areas of improvement? Like, does somebody have a skill set that we can leverage? Or is there areas that we need to enhance? And then, based on their confidential suggestions, mm-hmm. in certain planning sessions, certain events, I would say, hey, X person, why don't you pair with Y on this? They either have had an interest in the past of learning on that, or you can help them do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. To start pairing and bringing up that person, one, to show them that we recognize them, we trust them to do the work, but we're gonna give them someone to, to help them. And then that person that works with them reports back to myself, the manager, on the progress. If that person still isn't progressing, maybe partner them with somebody else. Yeah. If you're seeing a trend and not moving the needle, then that's when you have the conversations with the manager and say, where do we need to go next? And maybe it's just, they're not doing well with the team. Maybe they are used to working in their own bubble of the skill set that they are feel most comfortable with. And that's fine if there's an area that that might be better suited for them. So just finding if they have the aptitude to do something else, if they are coachable, if they're not, and it really is a performance issue that cannot be coached, same situation that you would have in any organization, then you would escalate it and go the appropriate routes. But give them every opportunity to work with the teams to help build them and ask them, are you even interested in this? I've had people that are like, no, but now that I see what you do, I find that's kind of cool. And I go, fantastic. 
would you like to learn how to be a scrum master or a coach? I'll let you facilitate and start guiding them into that role. And you never know, they might be fantastic at it, but they didn't have the opportunity because they just thought, oh, well, I'm a tester. I'll always be a tester. So it, you just really have to build the trust with the people in order to, to gauge what can be done. Yeah. The, the shocking thing for me was dealing with developers who were like, uh, you just, just tell me what to do. <laughs> I was going to say, you're, you're shocked that you had to deal with developers I, when you I, became I was, a scrum was, master. <laughs> that it was like, just tell me what to do, and I don't care okay. about, you All know, right. I, like, they, they basically, hmm. they actively did not want to collaborate. They're like, just yeah. tell me what to do, and then leave me alone. Because they've always been told what to do, and they, li- right. they, they lived in that world, and they were like, right. this is fantastic. Give me the requirements. I will sit in my dark corner, yeah. and I will code for whatever. Yep been there too and that's also a performance thing if in a scrum team you are not collaborating because that person either has a wealth of knowledge and could be helpful or is like controlling a certain aspect or maybe they are the person that they're not doing the best of work it's taking them a lot longer to do the work so that's another beauty of having the transparency and having the shared responsibility is you start to level out and find out who is overworking themselves who is kind of fluffing Mm -hmm. what they do and you have visibility more into okay well it took you 80 hours to develop that project was it really four and you sat on it because really no one was looking over your shoulder on how long it, it took so I under and I've worked with those developers and it is uncomfortable and you have techniques and ways to say all right you can be involved in as much or as little of the conversation but I need you at least there present listening and interjecting when needed if you don't feel comfortable speaking up that's okay but I need you to be there and providing information if I find out that you didn't share some like very critical information in that session that's when we're gonna start to have a problem. And I'm gonna have to escalate the inability for that person to change and adapt to a new process because that's also a skill set you want on your team because you know it's never gonna change. And if you have somebody that is unwilling to change, that's just one change that you've done. What about the next and the next? If they're always gonna be the one that's resisting, is that really the right position for them? Maybe not. I mean, like if I feel like we've hit a whole different podcast topic that we could burn all the time on uh, talking about like, listen, like they're developers that work their whole career on that. Like, well, I'm too busy. I'm a rock star. I'm always working on latest fire. And that's Uh, fine. And you can still keep doing that as long as you are working collaboratively with the team. And if and if you all say, hey, that's great, you're going to pick that one up. I'll let you deal with that. Let us know if you need help. Mm -hmm. And if the team is still performing, what's the harm in allowing them to still have that safe space if they're still doing what needs to be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't want to know. They all got to be in the same room and they all got to be typing together and uh, talking at the like, same time. Like, That's exhausting for a lot of people. Uh, I can't uh, do it. Like w- w- wolves, like working on latest fire, like th- those people, they scare me big time. Uh, especially when they're like, I'm the only person who can touch X application. Right. Now that's and uh, that can never happen. Yeah. That situation is inappropriate because if that person wins the lottery or just gets su- sick and tired of listening to me and says I quit, now who's going to pick up that? That's never yeah. allowed to happen. Yeah, but the, like yeah, but those uh, again, this is only my terrible worst experiences sure. that I go back to. Sure. Those people advance. Those people are like, well, that person's indispensable. I gotta have that person. We're, we're also we're only talking about terrible organizations at this point. Got it. Uh, yeah. So like, put, put a firewall between organizations. We, we don't want to hear about any of your new age ones. Yeah, everyone's yeah, yeah. respected, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and you only get you only get promoted for merit and being a nice person. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, meritocracy <laughs> is not. I don't, like that's not true though, because that you could ask somebody, would you rather promote like a typical leader? Would you rather promote someone who has uh, good communication skills? and is a so-so worker or someone who's an absolutely fantastic worker and kind of has crappy communication skills. It depends. It depends on the role that they're going to be promoted into. Because if they're not going to be a people leader and they're going to be a tech expert, absolutely put them in that place. If I need somebody that really I need more of the soft skills, Mm -hmm. then not. And that's why I really love the organizations that understand and respect that you can still be an executive or a manager, senior manager, 
and not have direct reports because you have the prowess and the skill set is respected in that area, but maybe you just don't need to have people report to you. That's perfectly fine because you're bringing just as much value to the organization by not being a people leader. Yeah, I, I could I could sign on to that. You definitely need people who are, are effective in their in their discipline, but mm-hmm. they need to be contributors. I think of like senior level people in that kind of role. Mm. Maybe they don't necessarily float from team to team, but they like they'll 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 anchor your whole team when they're on it. You know, they'll kind of push the team. So, I mean, this is not a great topic for the like the the companion topic of this, which is you're on a new team. They already have Scrum slash Agile experience. Mm-hmm. That's probably a better topic for these people because like th- those people will then become the cornerstone of your team to say like, okay, well, we carried over eight points from the last sprint, so maybe we should cut that in half and then our normal velocity is this, so like maybe we should add a little extra because we some of it was carry over and it's almost done. And like those people <laughs> will be like, don't worry about it. Like, it's, like <laughs> you're thinking too hard yeah. about this. Like it's just, it's, you know, 20 points, whatever it is, mm-hmm. like that's just what it is. Don't even worry about it. Like just think about the complexity of the tasks and whether we can get it done for kind of forget about the points mm-hmm. for a second because they've done it before so they have a little bit of confidence in it so hey i guess we're pivoting to okay we're going to the new yeah it's, the new it's a new situation. team you know Sounds what i mean great. like I, I don't know what the circumstances uh, are maybe we'll deal with that later the circumstances are that would create a new team you maybe your program is expanding or maybe one of your teams grew too big or whatever and you got to cut you know make a break and cut it in half or whatever uh, or maybe you're taking two people off of an existing team, bringing them over, and hiring a couple more people to work with them. I guess it also could be a truly, truly new team. Like we're starting a new initiative. We hired mm-hmm. a bunch of outside, you know, Absolutely. employees for the first time, and it's new. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they have agile experience, whether yeah. it's some, yeah. but something. Wouldn't you have to like? figure out what their agile experience really I, that is. That was going to be my first point. Oh, okay. It's like right. the same, it's almost, it's the same process for any team that I join, regardless yeah. of how long they've been doing whatever is, all right, what is your level of understanding of agile in the various frameworks? Because some of them may have worked in fantastic shops that they truly were releasing on a daily basis. They had one week sprints and they were just flying through stuff. And then we have people that, oh, well, we had three week sprints and we released like once for every quarter. And, you know, we, our product owner was our manager, all the stuff. We were like that, you had a Kanban board and you called it agile. Yeah, like right. that, that's the, the level. And then going through that same process of, let's get a baseline of what we're gonna be doing on this team and understanding who has the skill set to kind of guide and coach the rest of the team on the process. So that one's easier. And hopefully the organization is also on board and or if it's splitting the teams, then likely they would have had some sort of transformation already. But if it's a new company that doesn't know Agile, they were like, we wanna go Agile, we're just gonna hire a bunch of people that have Agile experience, we're gonna create a new team you might have a fully functioning agile team and then the organization is now hindering them from being agile. Mm. We want Gantt charts, we want progress yeah, yeah, reports, yeah. we want yeah. all these other things that you make us go, that's yeah. the whole point of going agile is to start to guide the organization away from this. So then your work is outside of the team. We, we talk about that way, way, way too, way, too, way often. too much. Way too often. How about, that? How about the, the concept of. Let's the, just throw that one. No, the, the, the concept <laughs> of the bubble, the bubble of agility yes. of like, we, yeah. the, the organization's got to do all the requirements. And then when they do all the requirements and then they decide what the priorities are, then they'll bring it to you and they'll give you requirements. Mm-hmm. Talking, there'll be a handoff. But then they'll be like, okay, now that you've got everything that the business wants. Air quotes, everything. Oh, yeah, everything. Uh, now you can start your little agility now thing. Now you can over start there. your agility okay. and let us know how long yeah. it's going to take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, go, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just give me a date. So, literally, you just gave us a waterfall project. Yeah, yeah. But well, that's them. That's them. It's in a backlog, yeah. so it's agile. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what that is. Yeah, yeah. I say we talk about this too often mm. because I think the way through this one is to bring your product people into the agility bubble first. Like leadership, I I don't know, give or take, whether they can ever, if they were left out of the agile transformation, they're gonna fight it kicking and screaming. If they weren't trained, they don't understand. Not always, but 
the problem with that is yes for the team to get the right requirements and the work in order to be efficient in delivering bringing the product people absolutely yeah. if the manager and i've had this situation if the manager is not on board with the transformation and you're not coaching them the information and guidance that they're giving the team might be counterintuitive to sure. everything you're doing on a database basis and sure. then you're wondering why are they still this is mine i'm only going to do this right. it's because the manager is expecting them to deal with the same performance metrics mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. and are telling them eh you don't really have to do this agile thing yeah this is all just for show we'll go back to the old way at some right. point in time so your toxic person is outside of your bubble which you'll never get a, away from because if they have a long-term and or trusting and or close relationship with that person you're never going to bridge that gap i like to hear agile advice that's like a, you just can't <laughs> That's, you just can't do it. No, because <laughs> like, because like, most people, most most people that are trying to like sell you their book, like they'll never tell you. They'll be like, hey, so buy my training. Yeah, we just I mean, sure, out. sure, but absolutely, don't do it. Go go around, yeah. figure every way around sure. it. But if you don't address things, these things head on, you're going to make your job and everyone else's job a lot more yeah, right. difficult. The reason I think product is the gateway to this is because anybody who might be in the organization who understands the need for having a, a team dedicated to one thing any of that mm -hmm. basically what i'm saying is anyone who understands context switching mm -hmm. anyone who understands th that the amount of interactions between team members will mm -hmm. drag down all the intra-team mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. and and therefore like you, that's why you shouldn't have a team of 30 or whatever mm -hmm. like, right. anybody who understands that stuff I, they, they probably don't work in the technology department. That's where I'm going with this. The basics of why I would want to spin off a new team or why I want to cut a team in half or why when I put a team out there for the first time, mm. I need to give them some time to hit their stride. Th that is something that I would not expect like a, a typical manager to understand. They'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I gave the team, I, I bought this Scrum Master and they're super expensive and I really don't know what they do. Uh, why are they not hitting their stride in Sprint 1? You've not now gone into all the whys. Uh, no, I'm not trying to stick with new teams. So you're saying people outside of where the team lives would not understand the value of going agile? Uh, or no, like all the... No, you're right. Let's try to stay in the lane no. that we're in with, with the, you have a new team. So with the new team, let's say you come in as a Scrum Master for a new team. Mm-hmm. There's going to be pressure from the organization to say, why is the team not up to speed? Why mm -hmm. is the team not have a stable velocity? Why is the team not mm -hmm. involved in, I don't know, whatever, relationships, different parts of the business? Mm -hmm. Like, w what I think of, because I'm on the product side now, so I don't, like, I, mm -hmm. I don't care about this so much stuff anymore. I'm aware. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> stay in your lane. Yeah, I'll stay, stay in mine. I'm staying in my lane. <laughs> The listeners are now, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're in the Corey Bryan relationship now. He's like, you stay, <laughs> stay on your side. Get out of here. Stay on my side. <laughs> you stay in your P.O. crap. I'll stay in my, uh, my fluffy scrum mastery. The, the reason I say bring the mm. P.O. into it as, as early as possible is because the, the, if you have a new team, I don't know what the P.O. relationship to the new team would be. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a part team, so they're probably new too, right? Mm -hmm. But it, that product person needs to be involving the team as quickly as possible in whatever discovery work they're doing, mm. what, whatever mm -hmm. vetting out requirements from the business or with customers or whatever. And that, that will be a new dynamic because regardless if, the, if you have a new team that's newly formed that has agile experience or not, getting developers involved in the active vetting of requirements mm. and discovery of features, yes. it could be new even yes. if they've come from agile or not. Mm -hmm. Because it could have been kept out, like the whole bubble of agility thing we're talking about. They could have been kept out of that. They could have, honestly, they could have come, they could know everything about working uh, agile, Kanban, whatever you want to do, and they could literally have never talked to a customer their whole career. Yeah, because the product, they could have worked in a, the product owner was like an actual product where yeah. it was client facing. They never talked to a user and that was just whatever the product owner said, that was it. Mm -hmm. But now if you have the additional level, if you have your product person, whether or not they're in IT, in the business, then there's all the other business requirements and strategy that they might never have been involved in. Mm -hmm. And I have a team that 
they were like, yeah, they just told us they don't want to be in any of those meetings. Uh, <laughs> they don't want to work with the business at all. Yeah, I could 100% <laughs> see that. This, again, this is like we're bordering on a whole separate podcast, which mm-hmm. is like why it, it's something about like agile resistance or something like I'm not really That's sure what like the, a, you could have a whole podcast yeah, like, I know. Like, like a series. I'm not exactly sure what the topic is, but the, the, the point of the topic is I'm not really shocked, but I am sort of I, like I was sort of have to pause for a second when a developer tells me I don't understand why we want to put a vertical slice of functionality out and get customer feedback. Mm. Part of it is like my brain is just moving at a million miles an hour and I just want to move on to the next thing. But the other part of it is <laughs> sometimes I get asked questions that are so basic, mm-hmm. uh, childlike curiosity type mm-hmm. of questions that I have to stop my brain mm-hmm. and think of it from a perspective of someone who knows nothing about the industry or, or the experience of working in software development at all mm-hmm. to answer a very, very basic question. Now, the more that I think about it, the more I have great difficulty answering super basic questions <laughs> like, why is it important that we go to production with something that a customer might not even use? They, we might do a demo for them and be like, that's great, but we're not going to stop using our current product and switch over to yours until you have two or three more features mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like, yes, mm-hmm. but I don't even have a great answer. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm even reaching for an answer. Like my answer, my first answer is you need to do it because it, be, it forms a good habit. That would be my first answer. Okay. It forms a good habit. Mm-hmm. Okay. We've sw- we've we've completely gone oh, way yeah, off yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, as long as you're okay with that, yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. fine. Okay, because this, this is nothing to do with the con- with I, the topic. I don't know that's if I'll fine. leave any of this in, but uh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So all that, if whether or not the user, if the product owner has prioritized it and said that this is functionality we want to release, you release it. It might be this is an experiment to see if it is something that they even want, and we can't really gain that who's gonna use it, usability, all that feedback, unless we get it out there. Even if they say, we're not gonna come to you, you might get other clients from somewhere else that are like, oh, that feature's great, I'm missing that in X, Y, and Z over here. Also, for, like you said, the vertical slicing reason. If we wait, if you have something done, why would you not push it to production? Boom! Mind blown, because why are you gonna just continue to build this bucket of stuff that is releasable and then go for a big push and then you blow it up because it didn't have the capacity to do all that stuff or all the stuff wasn't integrated? I I can't answer that. All right, sounds great. Then those are the, those ask the question (laughs) to their question, why wouldn't you? When I encounter questions so basic like that, I didn't even want to. I didn't want to say basic because it sounds like I'm it's, condescending. Yeah, it, it's not like, basic. It, it's it's, not a, it's just a very different. It's a different viewpoint from what we as agilists live. As of like, of course you would do that. Why wouldn't you? And then because we live it, we don't always ask those questions. And then they ask, and you're like, "There's a reason." Hold on, I just I'm not sure how to uh, explain yeah, right, the reason yeah, to you right yeah, now. Yeah, that, that was that was me. That was me very like, recently. I worked backwards. Mm. to the real reason i was like because releasing the production shouldn't even be something that is considered an effort like it, it should be a non well, non thought assuming they have uh, yeah, I, I automated realize I'm deployment a, and i like, realize yeah no, i know <laughs> i i understand what i'm asking for mm-hmm. but i was like i don't need to come down to your level to build back up you need to step up to the level that i'm at to saying all of this stuff like, can things seamlessly roll to environment to environment successfully? Mm. Can you trust that the infrastructure just works? Like, if you can't, then you really need to take a hard well, look. That, yeah, that's a whole other topic, though. Like, that is like a can you get it up there? You He's asking why would we put something out there regardless of how it gets yeah. there? And then if you ask them yeah. why wouldn't you? They might go, oh, well, I guess it doesn't really matter. Or they might go, well, because here's all the other pieces or functionality or other integrated things that might not actually, and then you get more information rather than giving them the answer of, well, this is what we're taught and this is how it is in Agile. 
dig a little deeper into why they are thinking that or why they would think that that would be something you wouldn't do. And you might get more information out of them. Let's talk about the customer for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's center on the customer. The business value of I can push, change, A, B, C, whatever, Mm -hmm. to production is zero. Because until that change is in production, the business value delivered is zero. Mm-hmm. So like whatever you have to do to seamlessly push production, mm-hmm. you should probably do that anyway as a representative of technical agility mm-hmm. to make sure that everything you work on can seamlessly just move to the next level. I guess the only reason that this very, very loosely fits in the bounds of what we're talking about is because you would have to introduce like a new team. They may not be new to Agile, but they may come from another organization that was doing good business agility, mm-hmm. but not good technical agility, mm-hmm. right? I could completely understand and empathize why a developer might say, well, I need a ticket in this sprint to say, move my code to production. I need a story that says, move my code to production. Yeah. And, and uh, like when you're early mm-hmm. in your And if you don't agility, have any CI, yeah, CD, that's, that's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we'll have a little pajama party and we'll all woo in the exactly. middle. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But like those shops that do that kind of stuff are night and day from shops that don't even deal with that. You know. But, but also if you ask them like, okay, well, yes, it's effort. Maybe it'll take you a couple hours because you just recently did the changes. If we wait four months... And I say, hey, let's push that to production now. How much longer is it going to take? Is it, are you going to now take like twice as long because you're not familiar with the package or like the the code changes and you have to do X, Y, and Z? All the reasons why, if you can do it now, just get it done and it's there and you don't have stuff lingering and now your environments are out of sync because you have stuff lingering Mm -hmm. and that's not pushed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All the tech debt stuff. The other thing I'll say is like once you push production once, like now you have an idea of what the process takes and you can do it again because every time you do it after that is well, a little easier. Hopefully. You hope. Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm assuming middle of the night pajama parties at this point. But even still, every I've worked on teams where every release was different because it was a different package or a different product because we were supporting multiple products. Like nothing was similar, basically, <laughs> at that yeah. point. <laughs> to segue us to another topic which is a team that you are new to you're the only new member of that team but you happen to be the scrum master slash agile coach Mm -hmm. sorry i was listening more to how you were saying that and thinking like you were going to be like rod roddy on the price is right than actually listening to your question (laughs) (laughs) which question were you asking again new Uh, to me i like it I like I like uh, that uh, you were listening less than I was listening. Like uh, only one of us cannot be actively listening. I feel like we just hit our stride to pivot to our next uh, category. Mm. Yeah, that, like when you're new to the team, that's the category that we're talking about. When you're new, to yes. the, you're the only new element to the team. So you're a new scrum master. You get a team. Mm-hmm. Like, well, all right, all right. Take me, walk me through the process. Like, what is the first thing you need to do? I mean, I, I would think the first thing you need to do is assess is like, are they dealing with real agile here or is it some kind of layer put on top of their old project management and that would need to make that assessment first yeah and typically i would even like try to get that information before i even join the team because <laughs> i'm not walking in depending on the, the severity of what's going on i might not walk into that team so i think the ones that are i'm completely new to the team they really haven't done agile before i think that one is probably the easier one to come into right out the gate because they probably don't have any bad habits they don't really know what's going on any progress you made towards agility is a win you might have a lot of resistance and change management issues with the team because if they are a very cohesive group getting the trust and inserting yourself and then being like hey we got it it may take you a good three to six months before you even get to the point where they trust you enough to like actually say okay yeah we'll we'll try that the first few months is really just monitoring getting a set like a sense for what they've got going on and figuring out where you can start on adapting them unless the organization has told you you immediately like 
change it immediately right now and they have given you that support Mm -hmm. then yeah go in and say this is how we're going to do everything that has not been my experience i i I wouldn't expect that that would be pretty much anyone's experience like (laughs) delegating authority to the scrum master to say just change it I mean, I, I've had teams that are like, you will just tell us what the best practice is mm-hmm. to do. But I'm like, I can't tell you what. It, exactly. Like if we're doing relative estimation, I can't tell you what a three is. Right. And that's all the, 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 that's where you become, and this is kind of the team that I was on and where I started out, it was, hey, we need this team to become agile. I understand you have never been a scrum master before. You want to be a scrum master and get the team transformed. Mm-hmm okay yeah sure i'll take that on so i had to figure it out learn it and then slowly train them on the pieces of it as we went along so it was a slower process than if i were to go in now but we had a lot more fun because it was let's try this experiment let's do this and it it wasn't a a big thing we weren't changing a ton of stuff because we were slowly progressing them into more agile ways i want to ask a question but i'm afraid it's going to pivot our conversation so ask it and we'll cut it all right (laughs) Corey's telling me how to cut now uh the, the way that the team would try something and then pivot if it didn't work would be through retrospectives but let's talk about what we tried this sprint and Let's see if it was effective or not. Can be, not always. Yeah, I mean, yeah, could yeah. be, could mm-hmm. be. But like uh, built into the system, like if we're using Scrum, mm-hmm. built into the system, that's your time to check to see if what you're doing, what you've tried, is effective. Mm-hmm. What's your question then, sir? I can't remember what it was. Sounds was, great. I was leading somewhere with this. <laughs> I think where I was going with this was new to me with Agile experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, we talked about the, so the entry point was. They might have agile experience, but you need to figure out what that means. Yes. The difference being with this one is what that means and now how to teach them what it should be and break all the habits Mm. that they had. So that's why sometimes it's easier to come in when they have no agile experience because they don't have learned behaviors that you now have to break yeah, yeah. when they're all, they've already been doing it and you come in and they're like oh we got a good flow we're doing agile and you come in you're like no you're not here's all the things we have to change yeah, yeah. now it's like you're judging them yeah. or you're telling them they've been doing something wrong and nobody wants to hear yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be a little more soft with those depending on whose idea it was. Some of them, granted, they are anti-patterns. If they're working for the team in the short term, don't touch them. Mm-hmm. Like, just don't. Pick the little things the here and there of like, hey, this might be more effective for us. Like for all these various reasons, let's try it. But don't rock the boat too much. What are the bigger things that you will not that you will leave on the table while you deal with deal with smaller things? It it all depends because every team is going to be different. But if they are delivering at the end of the sprint and they are working together and they've, they're cross training each other. I kind of don't touch too much of their delivery yeah. methods and or the backlog management unless there's something like glaring that they're not doing correctly. Work more on the team collaboration, the, the, the events so that it's more soft of like, yeah, this isn't a judgment of how you're doing your work. Mm-hmm. It's more of like my job as a scrum master might be a little different of how this scrum master did it before, like just very soft. And then as you build their trust, start diving into why are we doing this this way? Because they may have made decisions to do or adapt an anti-pattern because the organization, the management, whatever, there's a reason why they did it. And me coming in as a new person and go, this is not agile, why would you do that? That's ignorant of me to assume that I know better than them. So leverage their knowledge because there might be a very valid reason why they're doing it and it was out of their control at the time and you can go and te- you know, talk to whomever it was that was causing that to try and address the root cause, not the thing that's visible in their 
their sessions. I'm terrible at this. Uh, so just to bring that up. Uh, I'm, mm-hmm. that's, that's no, a, you're fantastic the, at the this. First thing yep. to, don't you start with me. The, the, <laughs> the first thing to bring up is like a, uh, the, 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 the non-judging uh, part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not, that's, uh, like, judging that's why is, you're not a scrum master yeah, anymore. Judging is a cornerstone of my personality. I yeah. understand. Yeah. Hence you're a product owner now. Yeah. <laughs> you live in that space because you can judge all day and that's fine. Yeah, the roadblock to having a super judgy personality and being in product is sometimes you get evidence that your ideas are garbage. Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have to... Either steamroll with it until you can get enough evidence to support yourself. Or cry yourself to sleep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> those are your options. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. those are the options. I've gotten pretty good at trying to come, on, come up with ways to measure success. Mm-hmm. So that we can have the conversation of, is this idea a uh, fact or crap? Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. so, so that we can say, rather than uh, just go based on my assumption. Because like, uh, and, and I also feel like this sort of goes under the banner of new to me and has done Agile before. Especially when you have teams that are like, oh, our product owner only shows up once every couple of days. And They're not your product owner. They, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You, that's something that's that, yeah that's my response to most of my teams is oh well our product owner they're over there i'm like then that's you can call them the product owner but they are not doing the responsibility who is right. doing x y and z oh this person okay call them what they are but they are fulfilling the role of the product yeah, owner yeah. yeah that's pretty typical situation mm-hmm. i think yes uh, like what like uh, i'm trying to think of other typical situations that i dealt with not not under the banner of being super judgy, but because we're talking about being super judgy, <laughs> like it's just there's just basic stuff. For example, like any program or group of teams, or I don't want a single team, any single team that estimates in hours, like I wouldn't join that team. I, I wouldn't take the position if my team was like we're going to switch mm-hmm. to hours from whatever we're doing. I I'd be like I don't want to work with you anymore. I, I even would I even go to the point of because I know some teams and some organizations are hours at the task level what for like i just i get so there's no value in this that i can see and i just nope it just gets to the point of you're losing the trust in your team and they feel like you're micromanaging them and we're just yeah. why are we here doing this but yes agree with you uh. but they might have a reason as to why same similar one of the teams yeah. i'm coaching is oh well our delivery manager has asked it to align with other teams and their dashboards and whatever right. because other teams are doing it not the best answer but that just means we need to do more coaching at that level to get them understanding why ours are not uh, at, at the level of the other teams or at the level of the people that are dealing with that delivery manager the level of the delivery manager and the dashboards to say what's the purpose and i guarantee a lot of it is accounting and budgeting for the hours for the teams but yeah it's it, exactly so bigger than me understand it's outside of the control of the team so therefore it is not something i'm going to tackle and or raise with them because mm-hmm. they're just going to tell me well this is what we have to do yeah because we've been told to do it yeah. so that's that's not appropriate for me to to get on them about it because yeah. they can't change it we did a whole podcast since we were talking about outside influence we did a whole podcast uh, on uh, when mm-hmm. you should split teams mm. what, what, are, what are the markers what are the signs that you're ready for a team split we did a whole podcast on that which I feel is part of that other column uh, mm. that we don't want to dig into of the why, why 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 are why is it I mean we, we've why run out of it? the other the first column yeah, we so have I but mean, I mean we, we probably could uh, <laughs> we could continue we, to we dive into it we probably could have continued yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's, it's such an alluring category you want to you want to it's like the 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 big Christmas it's, present under the tree you just so, want to tear I mean, it apart it's, so, <laughs> like, it's an attractive category all right that's all I'm saying it's just all right the We've talked about the new teams and what you do. Yeah, I mean the obvious one. The obvious one is a team has grown too big and they're they're cutting in half. The the other non obvious one is they're either expanding program or bringing on a new project. Mm-hmm. Right. Those are other reasons that new teams come on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess we should stick with one lane or another. Or is it is it a new team? that's being formed by the organization for a new purpose, like I'm hiring a new team Hmm. completely. Why am I hiring a new team? You know, what is their purpose? Mm -hmm. 
versus uh, a team has gotten too big. There. So let's cover the reasons why you might need new teams. So you just went over a couple examples. Oh, did I? So you said the team is growing and you need to split teams. That's that's a normal situation. If the product, I'm assuming, the reason why you have more and more people is because you need more people to handle the backlog and, and the product is growing, mm -hmm. which is perfectly normal. And you just go through the, the process of figuring out who goes on what team so that your teams are cross-functional mm -hmm. and they could adequately attack what they have in their backlog. Now, that's one reason why we could have the, t the organization was just like, all right, so we're gonna be agile and we're gonna restructure and here you go. Here's your teams. What do you do then? Oh man, here's my teams. <laughs> Thanks organization. <laughs> Are they cross-functional? Are team. they, yeah, like here, here's your teams. Now we have X team over here. here here's your platform uh, team. And you got this team over here and I could totally see it. I can completely see it. Cause that's, that's the way that a, especially larger organizations, something will come down from on a high or like an organization that I was at one time, some SPC or something that if I could ever find them, I would slash their tires on the side of the road, came in and sold the leadership of the organization on safe and mm. uh, taught them. Well, they're an SPC. That's their job. That's I what mean, they're supposed yeah. to do. Yes. Sell, sell their wares. <laughs> But they, they sold they sold the leadership on snake oil salesman coming in. Yeah, the whole leadership was out for a couple of days, getting taught safe, and they all came back with their little laminated safe placard they paid. You know, this was way back in the day, so it was. They paid How do you feel price. about safe, Brian? I don't really have super strong feelings about safe. Kind of, kind of feels like you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of getting the sense no, that I you don't, might I have don't. Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, <laughs> other than I probably would not seek to work at an organization that professes mm -hmm. to use SAFE. Uh, I kind of feel that the normal organization that would be attracted to using SAFE is just looking for something they could take their current PMO framework and lay over the top mm -hmm. of it and completely replace all the titles and positions and not change anything and feel good that they are now agile. That's, that's the normal organization. But there are some organizations that adopt like, you know, s smaller subsets. Mm -hmm. of, like they don't adopt the whole enterprise, full scale, full, full blown, full bore. I don't remember what they call the, <laughs> what they call the full blast. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> what they call the, the large scale solution. The yes, enterprise large, solution is safe. Yes, safe. Large scale. Yeah. <laughs> the, the full Monty of safe. I don't remember what they call it. But there are places that try to get predictability out of the PI planning process. That's mm -hmm. what they're trying to do. Even if they only have a couple teams, they're trying to say, well, oh, we, we want to be able to plan quarterly. And we don't think that's too much for our teams. We want to plan quarterly and we're going to get everyone in the room. And then my issues with SAFE is start to enter the picture when I interact with these organizations and I say, okay, cool. Who's your full-time employee who's a release train engineer? Oh, we don't have one. The director of development or whatever over here, he he there, plays he's, that role. Yeah, he's he's do he's fulfilling yeah. that well, role. Well, who's your solution train yeah. engineer? Who's a full time? Employee? Oh, we don't have one of those. We don't practice that that layer mm -hmm. of the model. Okay, well, yeah. what what do you do? Like, what you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have the roles in place. Right. That the, the framework professes that you absolutely. 100% must have. That's what that's that's a little laminated placard. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. like, um, and that's what you all got trained and paid your very very expensive fees and pay your yearly renewal and whatever fees to do. But they're not doing that. So the benefit seems to be I become an SPC and I can make some money off of training. Sounds like a good gig. Oh, we were going on this road because we were talking about my horror stories with uh, uh, Safe with mm, the company. Yeah. So the company came in and the leadership got sold on safe they all mm. went to training they all paid their money they got their placard they came back and they're like look at this placard we're gonna get everyone in a room and we're gonna uh, plan a pi and they were real big about a pi it's a program increment it's gonna be a quarter we're gonna plan six sprints all at once and then we got in the room and they're like you have to do these in the first pi mm -hmm. and i was like but, but you have no idea 
what the team's capable of in the mm-hmm. first PI. How can you plan? Everything we we're going to build and deliver by the end of the last PI builds on what we build in the first PI. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, yeah. And they if, already have it planned out. If and literally they already, anything slips, yeah. uh-huh. anything slips, yep. you're going you're gonna to derail you're 12 weeks of, yeah. of plans. And, the, the, and, and quite literally... Yeah, that's exactly what happened. They came to the PI with a basically a pre-plan project mm-hmm. plan of work. Yep. Because again, they they tried to sync what the company was doing currently with what they were sold in the training. Yeah. And they brought it in, and the team basically told them, e- "This is not gonna work." Mm-hmm. Like, the developers, not even the you know the teams, uh, people where I was sure. representing the scrum masters and stuff. Yeah. I was representing. We were like, "This is not gonna work." You can't tell the teams. You need to think about you know what their historic mm-hmm. velocity is and, and break the work down and you haven't brought any of this work. This is all new work. You haven't right. brought any of it into the cycle. The product owners haven't kind of run it down, that kind of right. stuff. Right. And they, they say here's your here's your capacity, uh-huh. take take a percentage off the top, but then carry that across all six sprints and plan for it. I'm like, okay, so what about all the other stuff that pops up? Or when they do the first sprint of stuff, they uncover a whole other sprint of stuff. Yeah. So now you've jam packed or you've planned for six sprints of work, not actually knowing that that would be where it would fall or if they could do it. Like it just, yeah, don't feel it. That was my introduction. To yep. Safe. So. There are values to it. If you, uh, if, if you yeah. do it right and you say, here is the high level stuff that we want. And then the teams break it down and actually say, here's a, approximately what like the whole purpose of what you should be doing in pi planning not not saying here's the project plan and this is what you're going to do and the team just goes okay why am i here because you already knew what you wanted me to do and you planned it out for me the whole purpose was for me to come in and say what we could do to align with the strategy and vision that you've outlined for us and it's it's the opposite so agreed what i've seen is they're trying to take what they already had mapped out and just kind of put a different wrapper on it yeah yeah yeah. that that would be my big gripe is that that that, and that's the way the program that's the way it's sold and the advantage of safe is they are collecting in one place a lot of good concepts Mm -hmm. absolutely there there's there's invaluable information if you take what same as like any other framework take what works for you that you actually have a purpose for and you see the value in doing it do not force yourself to do all of the aspects in the forefront pick what will work in the short term give you value and then adapt other processes don't try to completely adapt to it all at once it just it doesn't all work all at one shot i've seen yeah, um, the longer I do this, the more I'm mildly surprised. Mildly, mildly surprised. surprised. Impressed. I'm impressed. Okay. The, the more I do this, the more I'm impressed. How many variations on the plan, do, study, act, a little Deming wheel mm. from the 1950s that there are? I was like, how many times do we re- need to reinvent Yeah, reinvent plan? it. I, I mean, I guess we'll keep reinventing it until people actually do it. We always will. and But that's the thing. Like, There's so many m- ways to do it. Find which ways work for you and use those. Don't say, well, we have to do X, Y, and Z because this framework says you have to do it. Okay, well, that's what the framework said for maybe this solution. Yours doesn't match exactly to it. So you use what works and just forget the rest of it or take it from some other framework. Don't, don't stick to it just because somebody told you. And that's what I tell my teams. You might be scrum, but that doesn't mean we have to do all of the stuff if you're being agile and you're delivering and your velocity is consistent let's not worry about the how and just work on how we can do better in the 50s episodes it's starting to become a recurring theme which is weird because the it's 50s old, this, oh this you, the, of this, your of your I gotcha. episode, i think this is episode 55 or like, 56 what? i can't remember but okay. in, the, in the 50s we start talking about how beneficial it is for the scrum master to understand how kanban works mm-hmm. because yeah, you might be, like your team, your individual team might be doing Scrum, but the direct leadership above you or maybe a program leads or some kind of g- combination of other teams that are working mm-hmm. with you or whatever, like they're only really working on a couple things. So you can represent that pretty easily on a Kanban board for a, a much larger snapshot of your program, like mm-hmm. some kind of visualization, right? Mm-hmm. And 
that's something that has come up in the last two or three podcasts to the point where I thought about reaching out to some of the there's a guy in the area there's a Kanban trainer and uh, I thought about reaching out to him to be like what 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 are what are scrum masters missing because uh, you're supposed to flow be, yeah you yeah you're supposed to be a change agent to the organization mm-hmm. but you can't really change the organization without helping the organization at a minimum visualize their work mm-hmm. and yeah flow is a huge part because again back to that back to the back to Deming right but really it's lean principles right it's like mm-hmm. the, the lean startup uh, book was this it's like you can improve the processes of whatever you want to improve mm-hmm. but if you're not improving the specific bottleneck mm-hmm. you're just wasting your time you, yep. you might as well not do anything yep and none of that has to do with scrum and, and, and not honestly none of those principles are in scrum like it doesn't even really talk about them I don't mm-hmm. think <clears throat> The scrum guy does lean, not lean principles. I don't think. Oh, uh, mm, not. Yeah, flow. No. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. But right. in the scrum guy, doesn't. Yeah, not in the scrum guy. It, yeah. it doesn't yeah. even cover that. Yeah, it's fine. But that's it's another podcast. Yeah, yeah. So I, scrum masters are like, oh, okay, well, I'll be a scrum master. Okay, well, you really should be maybe retitle it to agile something so you understand all of the aspects of things all of the values, all of the various aspects that you should be adapting into your Agile team. And I've told my teams this all the time. We are a Scrum team, but that does not mean that we shouldn't be adapting if something works from Kanban or less or wherever it is that meets our purpose. I'm okay with doing it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a purist yeah. as we're called. Oh boy! Oh, like, the p word, dude. Whoever uh, came up with that term, whoever <laughs> yeah, came up with that like, term, purist. Like, I know. Woo. I understand they're trying to invent a dirty word to apply to people that uh, try to apply the framework, like straight out of the box, uh, the way yeah, the framework yeah. works. Yeah, sure. Uh, Which I I understand. If you don't know how to do it, follow the rules first, and then learn how to break the rules. The whole shuhari. I get it. But the scrum master has to kind of guide them on that process of like, hey, we can probably break this rule because the team does not know which rule they can or can't break because they have no idea what it does or doesn't look like. So we have to be that guide for them and allow them to say, "Eh, okay, well, we can probably break this rule for now or forever. Who knows? Yeah. You shouldn't expect your team to know all that. That's, That's all the scrum master's job, which... Mm, yeah, you shouldn't expect your team to know it, but like uh, the, I feel the the hidden part of what we're talking about here is uh, when you join a new team, and uh, let's say for example they are agile. It, this probably would be an easier they example. Think when I'm saying they're that. agile. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's where I'm digging at. You join a new team, whether they're a new team or you're new to them, it doesn't mm-hmm. really matter. They think that they're agile, but mm-hmm. once you get in there, you realize you've joined a team that actually is not agile in any way, shape, or form. They're like, oh, we can't work on this story until our leads give us the technical design and have done all the requirements up front and have talked to the business and decided what we're going to build. And then, right? But yeah, but to them, they're like, well, once we get the technical design document, yeah. then we will break it into requirements and then we will put it into sprints and just, and over the next mm-hmm. you know, 16 weeks or whatever, we will deliver pieces to the test environment until it's all done in the test environment and tested. <laughs> and then once 100% of it is done, then we will roll it to production. Like I said earlier, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, why would we give it to the customer if we're not giving everything that we promised to the customer? And again, that comes from developers. That doesn't come from right. a project manager or even a product person. It comes from a developer on the team. Like, why would we roll anything out and mm-hmm. like, again my, my like my mind is blown I'm like, well yeah because oh. they've been given one big package of this is what it looks like mm-hmm. done they were not allowed to be involved in that process of yeah. okay well this yeah. is what they're asking for but could you give this piece yeah. how would you do that one piece and involve them in that process so there it's they're just following the same requirements up front yeah. and so to them yeah why would you release this one piece that has literally no value because there's 80 other pieces that still need to be completed before it has value so i tell them yeah you're absolutely right why would you doesn't make sense because the crux of your problem is you're still following the requirements up front the big bang yeah here's the whole thing instead of saying let's do these few smaller pieces 
you swayed from this topic. You wanted to dive into this topic like did, so I, bad, and I, then you like just jumped right I, back I went, into I the went, old one. I went back to what we were talking yeah. about before. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I like to. Oh man, I read the uh, Team of Teams by uh, General McChrystal. Mm-hmm. I read the Team of Teams book, and the team in the Team of Teams book, like super fast. I'm gonna, I don't. This is not related to any of this. In the Team of Teams book. He was like, well, we got the best military in the world, and, we, we, and we're not making progress against Al-Qaeda. Mm-hmm. That was his deal. And he was like, we had to figure out why, and we needed to share information because we were in the actual neighborhoods and, and not making progress. Mm-hmm. And yeah, by the end of the, basically, to cut you to the end of his story, he was like, I had to get everybody who was involved in the fight to Al-Qaeda, either like actual military units mm-hmm. with teams on the ground, mm-hmm operators either you know the cia whatever that were you know intelligence community people surveillance people and i can't remember how many teams he had in the book he had like either the number of six out of my head is like 70 but it might have been more than that mm-hmm. teams mm-hmm. represented on the call and his call was like two hours a day and I, in the scrum realm i interpret that as like the, the like you're scaling at mm-hmm. some point so at some point with you scale like you have your teams daily stand up and then you send a rep or whatever to the next one and then those people send a rep to the next one mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you cover the whole program he didn't do that he just had literally every, every team yeah. on the call for two hours every day and they would go around uh talking about what they wouldn't necessarily go around every single team Mm -hmm. but they would uh, go around when they're talking about their objectives and the only reason i bring up here is you might join a team and see that they're doing something like that and like Mm -hmm. they're on a daily call sharing information for an hour every day Mm -hmm. and you might be completely taken back by that and be like oh my goodness this is not the way to scale but in actuality like that's that's hot yeah it might be right it might be the reason I bring that up is because I'm concerned that there might be things going on that actually are working very well, mm-hmm. but are not by the book. Exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> done. You done? <laughs> I, I like. I don't know because I don't kidding. like. The, 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 I have seen enough where I could think about the situation and think about what's going on and kind of mm-hmm. hopefully understand what's happening. But if you're like a fresh out of the school certification whatever like mm-hmm. 18 months experience scrum like they're they're the scrum masters i'm less concerned with I, i'm more concerned with the trend that i see now with product people where they they basically have no experience and they're becoming no. product managers at yes. very very large companies correct and they would see stuff like this i guess the reason i bring this up why it's a concern to me is having been a scrum master if i saw something like this hopefully i can knock down my natural judging uh piece of my personality for a minute to, to think like is this an effective process was i making a point i don't remember <laughs> i think your point was was to try to roll down your your level of judging Judgment. yeah because even though it's not by the book for the situation for that org it might be the option and yeah, you could say that like scrum at scale or whatever scaling technique you're using, that many people in a call for that long, is it really valuable for that time? Yeah. However, in that situation, when you have a bunch of highly skilled individuals that are all trying to get to the same goal, mm-hmm. excluding any one person might be a detriment right. to the end product. Right. And in that case, yeah, that type of call and everyone being aware of what's going on across all of the areas could have a very significant impact on it. So yeah, but for most scrum teams, is that really the case? Are they all focused on one goal at that scale that it would be important for them? I don't necessarily think that that would be the case. Yeah. So for regular development configuration, CICD teams, like I don't think that's that would necessarily fit, but for something that is timely at that scale when you have so many people that are truly focused on the exact same goal, I could see where it is yeah. valuable. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I, I think the, the takeaway from this one is be less judgy, Brian. Yeah, Brian, stop the judging yeah. and be open to understanding the situation and the why. Ask the questions before you go. Do I have to? No, just make your scrum master do it. What if, what if I don't have a scrum master? 
Uh, can, I, can I tell the developer of the week to do it? <laughs> That's the block because you ain't going to get anywhere that oh, probably. Because they're going to be like, I ain't got time for this either, man. I don't care. Ain't nobody got time for that. All right, Corey, let's wrap it up. Well, uh, this didn't go where I thought it would go. <laughs> All right, so final thoughts on new teams. Whether if it's a new team altogether, new team to you, always come in with a open mind and figure out what's going on, why it's going on, what you can tackle in the short term and potentially long term while you're trying to build trust with the team, understanding the org structure and all of the things within the team's control and outside of the team's control that you should be addressing. All those things. <laughs>